Um, I am just going to set this up very briefly uh, by talking about how historic a time we live in. I mentioned it before. Sonia Sotomayor, Hilda Solis, Tom Perez, Secretaries of, of Labor, Supreme Court Justices, Raul Grijalva, uh, a representative who won our Friend of um, Education, our, one of our NEA uh, Human and Civil Rights Awards. We live in amazing times of opportunity and advancement and people being wonderful and respectful and then Donald Trump. Okay, does the irony just drip? Where I'm sure there's a few good ones, but the refuse that they're sending us, who are our students, who are our loved ones, who are uh, the families that we serve, who are our relatives, who are us, and uh, we still find that we need strong voices. We know that we still need advocates who will stand up for the rights of Latino families. And it's, um, we just had a big political debate. Our speaker is going to be introduced by our amazing uh, Gladys Marquez, uh, chair of the Hispanic Caucus for NEA. Um, so I won't give his introduction, but I will tell you that when you see the man with the hat come through the building, everyone knows an advocate is in the house. Everyone knows a man who is not <laughs> afraid of anything as he advocates for Latino leadership in this country to be respected and to grow. And it doesn't hurt having 10 million Latino registered voters on your side. So let me give the podium to Gladys to do the honors. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Lily, and buenos dias, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the NEA Hispanic Caucus officers, NEA Hispanic State Officers, and our fellow NEA Hispanic Board of Directors for joining us on the dais here today. These observances are wonderful opportunities to celebrate how far Hispanics have come in America and the contributions we are making to our great country. Our distinguished speaker today, Dr. Juan Andrade Jr., personifies the American dream. He was born and raised in Brownwood, deep in the heart of Texas. His father was an immigrant from Mexico who worked hard to provide the very best for his family. Dr. Juan Andrade grew up in a Brownwood barrio where the streets were unpaved and indoor plumbing was a rarity. The people in his barrio were predominantly Hispanic. They worked long hours under the unforgiving Texas sun to support their families. They picked cotton and hold weeds in cabbage, watermelon, cantaloupe, and peanut fields. One of Dr. Juan Andrade's enduring memories is that of adults in his humble community putting a hand atop his head and encouraging him to stay in school and get an education, and he did just that. Dr. Andrade was educated in Brownwood Public Schools where they were not allowed to speak Spanish and where there was not a single Hispanic teacher. In fact, the first Hispanic teacher he ever saw in Texas was himself when he went on to become an educator. Dr. Juan Andrade went on to earn a BA from Howard Payne University in Brownwood. His first job in education was as a high school civics teacher in Crystal City, Texas. It didn't take long for him to get in trouble, good trouble. Teaching the Bill of Rights and the U.S. Constitution to his students, Dr. Andrade immediately noticed something. The students were not understanding what he was saying. So, he switched to Spanish, and voila, epiphany, they understood. There was only one problem with that. In the state of Texas, at that time, it was illegal for a teacher to speak 
any language other than English, except in a foreign language class, of course. When a policeman came to his house to take Dr. Andrade to court, he said, are you John, alias Juan Andrade? To this day, he laughs about that. Dr. Andrade was cuffed and taken to the courthouse. When he entered the courtroom, it was filled with Hispanics, Latinos, cheering him on. He pleaded not guilty and returned to the classroom that very next day. His trial for speaking Spanish never came. Authorities had realized that Dr. Andrade and his lawyer were planning to appeal that case in the hope of overturning the very oppressive state law. So they decided to drop the charges. It wasn't long before he was in trouble, good trouble, again. This time for showing his class a film on the Mexican-American struggle for justice in America. The school administrators wanted him fired. However, the school board had changed and was now composed of four Hispanic members and three whites. And the four Hispanics had Dr. Andrade's back. His job was safe but not necessarily his life. Just before Halloween that year, rumors started to fly that Dr. Andrade's home was going to be firebombed. The Andrades fled that night to San Antonio while friends stayed in their home to protect it. Thankfully, the firebombing never happened, but the Andrades decided it was time to move on. He took a position in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as an education specialist for the farm work program and eventually moved to Chicago, Illinois, my home state, where he went on to earn a doctorate in education from Northern Illinois University and a postdoctorate from Loyola University of Chicago. Dr. Juan Andrade is the founding president of the United States Hispanic Leadership Institute, or USHLI. Ushli has registered a staggering 2.2 million voters, published 425 studies on Latino demographics, trained 750,000 present and future leaders, and awarded $1.3 million in scholarships and internships. Ushli sponsors the largest Latino leadership conference in the nation. Dr. Andrade, was also, is, is also the fourth Latino in history to be honored by both the United States and Mexico. In 2001, he received the Presidential Citizens Medal from then President Bill Clinton. In 2011, he received the National Otli Award, the highest honor presented by the government of Mexico. He even received the Chicagoan of the Year Award at iconic Wrigley Field during a Cubs game it doesn't get any better than that for a Cubs fan. And I can assure you, he is a Cubs fan. Ladies and gentlemen, please give Dr. Juan Andrade Jr. a great big NEA welcome. Thank you, thank you all very much. Um, just first of all, I'd like to just thank uh, President Lily Elkerson uh, for her leadership, my good friends at NEA and the Board of Directors, and uh, of course, uh, especially my Hispanic friends that are here today as well, and Gladys, thank you for that kind introduction. You know, those introductions are not easy to do. If y'all ever introduce someone, I'm sure you have, you know it's not an easy job. And if you haven't done it before, you have something to look forward to. <laughs> as, as a speaker, I never quite, I'm never quite sure uh, what's going to be said. And, and I asked Gladys earlier, do you have something to go by? And she said, I do. Uh, I said, what do you, what do you have? She said, uh, you know, uh, notes from your interview that you just did. I said, oh my God, what did I say? <laughs> and, but I, I was introduced by a school board member in Flint, Michigan. Uh, for a speech I was going to give there, and uh, this is where uh, this uh, anxiety kicks in when the speaker, the moderator gets up and says, ladies and gentlemen, it said that there's two kinds of speakers, one that doesn't need an introduction and one that doesn't deserve one. <laughs> there for a minute, I wasn't sure which one I was. <laughs> <coughs> 
Well, thank you all very much. Uh, you know, people notice that y'all can tell I'm not originally from Chicago. Uh, Gladys uh, shared a little bit about my Texas roots. And they said, you, you know, you guys from Texas, everybody notices y'all say y'all a lot, y'all this and y'all that. I, I, I'm curious, what do y'all say when you mean everybody? <laughs> we say all y'all, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all y'all. So I want to thank all y'all for being here. <laughs> and uh, I know it's lunchtime and you've had a busy morning already, so I'll try to be brief. I have to be brief. <laughs> I've been warned. Uh, but I, I promise to be brief no matter how long it takes. Uh, I just have some thoughts I'd like to share with you briefly about my generation of dreamers. Uh, dreamers that got us where we are today and the challenge to today's dreamers and the pursuit of educational opportunity that binds these two generations together. I was born into a generation of dreamers, and it was a, a difficult time, a dark time, as uh, Gladys alluded to, where it goes back even further, where we lost our land. Uh, we had the right to vote, of course. That wasn't taken away from us, because, but if, after taking our land, the law says you, you, you're, you're eligible to vote if you own property. And how does that work? You had to own property, pass the literacy test, and pay a poll tax of $1.75. You know, this is in the 1950s. People today wouldn't pay $1.75. But I remember my dad telling me, he said, you know, asking me, why are you guys stirring up all this noise about the poll tax and having to pay $1.75? He said, well, dad discriminates against poor folks like us. That we don't have $1.75. And he said, well, yes, you're right, son, but there's another, uh, there's another truth to that that you need to be aware of is that Mexicans are also very smart. Politically, we're very astute. We know there's nobody running for office worth $1.75. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm -hmm. But we went through a period uh, that was called forced Americanization of the Southwest, uh, starting with the loss of our of our land and, and, and the loss of lives. Over 200,000 Mexicans were, were killed, either lynched uh, or shot for trying to defend their property uh, back in the days in the 50s when I was growing up in the 40s uh, through this forced uh, Americanization of Mexicans. And, um, and when you think about the, the losses that we suffered, the biggest loss, the assault on our on us was the assault on our language and our culture, that it was in fact prohibited, as Gladys alluded to in the introduction. And were it not for my family uh, and my church, I would probably be monolingual today. Pero por la gracia de Dios y mi familia que me enseñaron español, me enseñaron que el español es el idioma de Dios, uh, saying that Spanish is God's language. My pastor said that when we get to heaven, everybody's going to speak Spanish. <laughs> and also, I, I, I started learning Spanish and uh, reading Spanish, singing Spanish, praying Spanish, worshiping Spanish, telling myself when I get to heaven, I'm going to rap with God. <laughs> and of course, I learned later on as I grew that God knows all of our languages as well. And uh, so there's uh, nothing there, but the, the, uh, the, the threat, the loss, that you see so many Latinos today through no fault of their own are monolingual today. <coughs> victims and their parents were victims of this forced Americanization. That's the, the consequence of that period of time. But it also launched a, a, an interesting struggle that plays out even today. It was a struggle between our home culture uh, that said that our parents told us who we were and our school culture that said we were something else. In my school culture, I was white. At home, I was Mexican. You know, and so there, thereby, that started off a, a, a conflict that played out very, very deeply uh, during that period and continues even today. 
though not as much as we uh, saw back then. But I decided long ago that in my life that if I had to live with laws, laws that were wrong, those laws are not there just to be obeyed. Those laws are there to be challenged. If they are wrong, we violate them. <laughs> we call it civil disobedience, and I've been a firm believer in civil disobedience. You know, this is nonviolent civil disobedience, you know, because that's a way to change laws. A law that would prohibit a Mexican boy from being able to speak his own language, punished for speaking Spanish on the way to school, punished for speaking Spanish at school or on the way home. That, uh, that law, that kind of a law, needed to be changed. It cost me my job, sure, and, that's, and my career. It was a short-lived teaching career. Uh, but it all worked out. It all worked out. I probably, you know, look, look at me now. You know, and um, <laughs> twice this week, uh, two uh, people noticed my little, they say, button. That's a nice little button you got. You know, what does that say? <laughs> oh, it's, it's, a, it's little, but only the President of the United States can pin it on you. <laughs> yeah. But in this part of is, is this conflict that that took, that set off that was launched through uh, this period of time. Everything that our research shows today that would interfere or otherwise hinder the ability or the opportunity for children to learn, especially minority children, African Americans, Latinos, Asians, everything that that we're not supposed to do was done. And, uh, and there's plenty of evidence of the consequences of that. We have progressed slower than most folks, than non-Hispanics. There was a study that was done where over a 20-year period, they wanted to assess the achievement gap, high school graduates between Hispanics and non-Hispanics. And, and introduced a lot of programs, uh, after school programs, mentoring programs, tutoring programs, and other kinds of programs that would uh, supposedly help. And then 20 years later, the time that it takes for, to study the analysis of a, of a new initiative, the study was done to see how much the gap had closed. 20 years before, the gap was 24% gap, and the percent uh, between uh, Hispanics and non-Hispanics and their high school completion rate. In 20 years, it closed four points. It was down to 20. That, that, we can call that some kind of progress, not much. But if you do the math, what it tells us that at the rate that we're going today, that if it takes us 20 years to close the achievement gap 4%, if you do the math, it'll take us 100 years to start graduating Hispanics at the same rate non-Hispanics are graduating today. Sisters and brothers, we don't have a century. We don't have 100 years to wait you know, to, to get there. We have to join our forces. We need the national partners to work with unions like NEA and uh, to make sure that we do the kinds of things that will put some, uh, that will accelerate this process. And uh, because uh, it has to happen. But I also want to use a, 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 the, a few minutes of the time that remains. Christine is really on the case over there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I spoke at National at the Labor uh, Solidarity Day March uh, a few years ago when we still had them. We had 300,000 people, trade unionists, at the mall, and we were given a time limit, and the way it was enforced was that the mic would go dead when your time was up. And uh, if you want to just seem silly to 300,000 people, keep talking when the mic's not on. <laughs> and, uh, 
but we but at the same time hispanics have you know, our love for this country has never been doubted in fact it is rooted well in uh, in military history of the united states where half a million latinos enlisted to serve even my father who was not a citizen you know enlisted to serve and said would you fight for your country and he said simon ese you know <laughs> and they gave him a rifle and sent him off to war you know and it's just and 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 perform with heroism you know there's uh, that latinos were decorated for uh, receiving the medal of honor and other uh, medals for gallantry and bravery uh, and valor especially under fire in fact there was one one incident general macarthur described the puerto rican army as the best trained he had ever commanded. And there was an instance where 1,500 enemy troops surrendered to a Puerto Rican. He, this one Puerto Rican captured, captured 1,500 enemy troops. He was firing every weapon that he could get his hands on as fast as he could. The enemy thought they were outnumbered and it was only one Puerto Rican. <laughs> and, this generation into which I was born, that we can be proud of, and I'd just like to use this observance to, to mention them, if I may, because they're the giants on whose shoulders we have stood, those who gave us what we have today, uh, and whose work we are committed to continuing. But there were Latinos in that period that dared to dream, despite the fact that our lives were threatened, our jobs were lost, and, and, and the sacrifices that we had to pay. There were, gen there were Latinos who dared to dream, to, to create those kind of institutions that would empower our community and change American society forever. We had the men and women of LULAC, who organized to defend us for, uh, in our rights and promote education. Dr. Hector Garcia, who organized Latino veterans. And Dr. Antonia Pantoja, you know, who organized Puerto Ricans so that they could take a group of aspirantes and help them get through school, mentor them and teach them how to stay in school and graduate and become leaders, run for office and these kinds of things. Many of y'all have never heard of Ernesto de la Garza, Hernán Gallegos, and Dr. Julián Zamora, but you've heard of the National Council of La Raza, known as NCLR. These are the founders of NCLR. They dared to dream that we could have a national organization who could advocate at the national level on policies affecting Latinos. We had Jack Otero and and, and, and Eva Serrano and Damaso Seda and Maria Porta Latina, among others, trade unionists who organized, who dared to dream that, that one and a half million Latino trade unionists could organize and themselves and their families into a viable political force in this country. They're the one, they dared to dream. Hector Barreto, senior, who dared to dream that we could organize businesses in America. Dolores Huerta, and Cesar Chavez, who dared to dream that we could organize farm workers. Former, the late Congressman Ed Roybal, who dared to dream that we could organize CHCI and Naleo. There's a number of people that we could single out that are worthy of mention, but it was a result of their leadership and their sacrifice and the risk that they took that we got the GI Bill passed. The Bilingual Education Act was passed. The Civil Rights Act, Act was passed together working with our African-American brothers and sisters. The Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act, both done jointly and with a coalition of other groups as well. Let me just close by saying that, uh, that our, our dreamers of that period, of my generation, left a, have left a trail for our new dreamers of today, that we can say that, that this generation has helped create three million Latino-owned businesses, generating an economy of $1.5 trillion a year, the eighth largest in the world. 
If Latinos were a nation, when the president convenes the economic powers of the world at Camp David, if, if Latinos were a nation, we would be seated at that table with a purchasing power of one and a half trillion dollars. And business development growth, developing new businesses in America at a rate three times faster than the general population. And we're especially proud of the fact that leading the way, not only among Latinos, but whites and African Americans and Asians, no one in America is creating new businesses faster than the Hispanic woman in America today. Our challenge to, to our dreamers of today is that I, I believe we can say simply that destiny has ordained them as the guardians of our rights, the guardians of our successors, of our successes, because today the Civil Rights Act is being ripped apart, the Voting Rights Act is being decimated, bilingual education is under attack, they weren't born when we passed these laws, but, now, but they are here now, and it is in their hands that destiny has ordained them as the guardians of those rights and to keep promoting education. Our goal is to have the best educated generation of Latinos in the history of the United States. That makes, to make sure that every child has an opportunity to get a good education. Working together as national partners with organizations and our union brothers and sisters here at NEA to help change education in America, change it for our children so that we too you know, can be there and shape in this country, shape in the future of this country you know, to give us that best educated generation that we have ever seen that we have are the engineers that we need, we have the teachers that we need, the professionals that we need, the paraprofessionals that we need, and all and on and on, that this is their task, not to reinvent the wheel, but to accelerate now. We've got the car moving, we've got the wheels moving, now they just have to step on the gas and, and give us some speed and get us there faster than time would tell. Thank you all very much for letting me be with you all today. Thank you. God bless you.